Well, I'm excited to announce our morning keynote, uh, and maybe I can introduce him by asking you this. What do the following things have in common? A $100 laptop designed purely for the needs of rural children in developing countries. A smart home lock that can seamlessly chat with your authorized home visitors over Bluetooth. And this last one is my favorite. A robotic crib, just released, a robotic crib that can automatically lull a crying baby to sleep. Could have used one of those last year. What all these unique inventions have in common, of course, is their prolific designer and inventor, Eve Bihar. For those of you that don't know him already, Eve is a world-renowned design guru and entrepreneur. And it should not surprise anyone that he was recently named by Forbes magazine as one of the most influential industrial designers of our generation. Eve is going to talk about how technical executives can bring design from the peripheries of their organizations, bring it to the core of how they serve up beautiful user experiences and products to their end audiences. And with that, it's my pleasure to invite Eve up on stage. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, I like the laptop story we just heard. We just had the same exact story back there with a, with a poor technical team who's trying to um, figure out how to bring presenter notes and keynotes. And so I walked up with a ThinkPad. I've never used one. Um, I haven't used a PC probably since 1994 or something. <laughs> so let's see how we, how we do this. I, I imagine you don't hear about design that often. Um, but maybe you're starting to, to, to hear about design um, um, more and more. Um, and you know, design isn't yet in the 99 cent store, but um, the way we've seen it progress, um, I think we're not, we're not uh, far from that. Um, and so why, you know, why hasn't it been such a, such a tremendous change? And why has design become um, so important? Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it really started to happen um, in the, um, you know, 2000, uh, between 2000 and 2005, um, when the internet became um, the place where, you know, the dialogue between the consumer and the enterprise and businesses started to happen uh, more and more. From the 70s to, to 2000, really, that main conversation between consumer and company uh, came from advertising, those 30-second ads. Um, after that, there has been um, a dialogue, a direct dialogue, uh, first through the internet and you know, blogs and whatnot, and now through social media. And that conversation now is um, a direct conversation. So what do, you know, these are, these are interesting statistics along those lines. 2.3 billion uh, people in social media um, you know, uh, worldwide. 34% of bloggers post opinions about products and services. So a lot of that conversation is about um, what it is that, that you make, um, what you're doing well, what you're doing not so well, the experience of your product, um, what delights them, your social platform, um, you know, what upsets them. So a lot of what they're talking about is really your product and, um, and your brand. So what we've seen is that company and customer um, are now linked, really, but what I believe is design. You know, it's really the first line of communication uh, between what you make and, um, and the people you're trying to speak to. And design has evolved as well. Um, it, you know, it creates tremendous value, and we know what kind of value it creates in two dimension. That are, those are the brands, the, the sort of graphic design elements, um, the, 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 the visual communication. Um, you know, there is a value in three dimensions, which um, is the industrial design, the, object that it, the, the objects that enable our lives. Um, you know, the, 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 from the furniture in our homes and our offices, to the tools that we work, uh, that we use for work and entertainment. And then this fourth dimension, which is the space and time. 
Um, and the fourth dimension is really enabled by technology. Now, you know, we can think about how a product behaves over time. We can design how it engages, how it is individualized, um, uh, and how it's, made, um, how it's made personal. So what is design today? Well, the practice of design is about integrating many different forms of, um, of, of design. Traditionally, as I, as I showed before, you had two-dimensional, three-dimensional, the fourth dimensional the, the dimension, which, I, which is really technology design, um, you know, it's about fusing them together. My company, Fuse Project, um, is really, which was started in 1999, um, has always been about fusing these different uh, practices um, that are related to design um, into, into something that is cohesive, into a cohesive whole. So I'll show you, um, you know, how we work. And it's, you know, how do you bring these different types of um, disciplines together? Um, we created an environment. We also created an office system that allows you to turn every table into a shareable area, into a meeting spot. Um, so within the entire office, within the entire environment, um, what is um, critical and important is that people speak um, beyond their department, that people talk um, based on projects and that the teams are created and cohesive, um, not you know, within, um, outside of their siloed. And I think this is very difficult to do for organizations that, um, that tend to be um, siloed in departments, marketing department, technology department, um, user experience, maybe even live separate of that and outside of that. Um, this experiment turned into our own experiment of how to work um, turned into uh, uh, an office furniture system, which we built with Herman Miller, the second largest office furniture manufacturer in the world. And um, it is reconfigurable into all of these different uh, types of environments, which you saw in the video. Um, reconfiguring it is important because your needs, the needs of your team change. Um, those teams that get together for a project grow um, need project rooms, uh, need meeting environments. And if you do that with architecture, um, you know how long and how expensive that is. Um, if you do that with furniture, um, and furniture that is made like a Lego system, it becomes a lot easier to do so. I want to talk a little bit about what happens in this kind of environment, in this kind of multidisciplinary environment. Um, this, is, this is a quote from, you know, probably um, the most recognized and celebrated graphic designer of the, of the um, 20th century, Saul Bass, Why Men Creates. Where do ideas come from? From looking at one thing and seeing another. From fooling around and playing with possibilities, speculating, changing, pushing, pulling, transforming. And if you're lucky, you come up with something maybe worth saving, using and building on. That's when the game stops and the work begins. And so this is why those, the, the, those office environments, those, you know, that, that's, that furniture system is so important because it puts the individuals that do the creating, the pulling, the pushing, the ideas exchange um, into, into, the same, um, into the same space, into the same environment. And you know, people see design as, um, and designers as sort of you know, sheltered a little bit or, or closed out from technology. But in fact, I want to show you that over, you know, the last century, um, designers, whether it's uh, Le Corbusier and Charlotte Perriant on the, on the right-hand side, whether it's Charles Eames on the left-hand side, um, they were always at the forefront of technology. Back then, technology was about making. Um, in the case of uh, Le Corbusier and Charlotte Perriand, they were looking at car factories and innovating the process of making furniture to make it more available. So the furniture is starting to look um, like this, mechanically built, manufactured in larger quantities, faster for it to be cheaper and to bring comfort to, to the masses. Um, on the, on the right-hand side, anyone familiar with the sculptural shapes of Charles and Ray Eames furniture um, you know, can see that this was started um, by bending, molding plywood because sculpting a piece of wood is a lot of work, um, whereas bending plywood is a methodology that allows you to create 
ergonomic comfort um, out of, out of um, sheets of um, thin materials and in a process that's a lot faster and uh, requires less craft. So, you know, this, these types of innovation, this type of thinking, um, this type of technology use is really what designers used, um, um, you know, uh, have always used. And so I'll show you our work in um, this type of setting, this sort of craft making setting um, for a second, and then I'll move into um, technology and design. But this is um, Herman Miller. This is us about six or seven years ago. Again, experimenting with uh, materials to create, um, to look if, if, if a chair could be made without framing. Every single chair that you see has some kind of metal frame, some kind of surround shape molded out of plastic, um, um, uh, usually rigid. And what we were looking for is to make a chair that is frameless, that doesn't have that kind of, um, um, that kind of heavy um, support all around it. Um, we made about 70 prototypes. Every single one is uglier than the next. Um, but, but we learned something um, at every one of those stages. Um, this is a quick video that, um, that shows the process. Um, a little bit where the inspiration came, which was actually bridges, in, in, in particular living in San Francisco. It's hard not to be inspired by the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and you, know, every, you can see sort of the evolution of the patterns and the, the, the full-size drawings and the elements um, that, um, that uh, eventually became uh, technical, um, became engineering, became three-dimensional. Um, um, of course, you know, this type of project takes about three years and we probably have thousands of sketches and hundreds and hundreds of uh, mock-ups and, and, uh, and models there. And this is the result of it, um, the sail chair and the sail chair line, which is the first unframed, non-framed um, uh, chair. It's the best-selling um, chair in the in, uh, in international markets. Um, you see it. You see it at Google, Yahoo, um, all those um, all those companies we know. Um, and it does have all of the ergonomic features that um, you know more involved chairs, more complex chairs that use more materials. Uh, have in fact, you know, it, I think it's just as a more comfortable, um, but it's about half the price of them. And this was the goal of removing that kind of structure and that kind of material. So technology and design is also what I've been practicing um, here since the mid since the mid '90s. When I came from Switzerland, I started working with Apple, Hewlett Packard, uh, Silicon Graphics, and um, you know, as I said, it wasn't something that was well understood, and that seemed to be uh, a part of how to build a successful company back then. So, you know, maybe I should just take us back a little bit to um, what is technology minus design? And I think <laughs> this is a pretty good slide. It's a well-designed slide. Um, so, <laughs> so when, when technology when technology fails um, in the everyday life, it's not because of the technology itself. Um, you know, the technology sometimes are, um, are, I mean, most of the time are, are incredible, are so, you know, uh, interesting and have so much potential. But uh, when, it, when technology, you know, fails, when, when these kind of products fail, it's because it breaks a human relational code. Because the, the, the user experience, the, um, you know, the, the, the moments, um, the social interactions that are created by these objects isn't well considered. Um, and, um, you know, in my opinion, it's not a technology problem. It's a design problem. Um, and so it's key that technology integrate uh, design um, at, uh, at the onset. So for me today, technology equals design. Um, Technology mostly has been commoditized. It's hard to just differentiate based on technology today. Um, whether it's software or hardware, it's not about the specs anymore. Um, it's really about how it's put together. And I compare it to fabric. Actually, this is on the left-hand side for you. Um, it's a, 
It's actually one of the assemblies from, um, from that um, furniture system for Herman Miller. Um, but for me, it's, it's, um, it's very much like going to a fabric store, looking at different technologies that can be used, different sensors, um, different algorithms, different AI, and picking which ones are right. Just like going to a fabric store where you pick the right fabric for the right use um, and the right outcomes. Um, and so technology is really the raw future uh, before design gets to it. And, um, you know, and when design gets a hold of that raw future um, with the right intent and the right approach, I think this is when we, um, we end up with exceptional uh, solutions. So you know, in this changing era of technology and, um, and design, um, we actually use a tremendous amount of AI. We actually use a tremendous amount of robotics. We actually use a tremendous amount of big data um, and, um, in order to engage with, um, with our customers. And I think it's the very first time in the history of design and the history of industrialization that um, we probably need new principles uh, because of new principles of design um, in, in the era of robots, AI, smart environments, and technology. There's been principles of design before. Um, and they, you know, Dieter Rams, George Nelson, um, but I think fundamentally we're in a different, um, in a different place, where really design is not anymore about making just things pretty. Um, my job is not to decorate the world; um, it's actually to create profound, important experiences that that change people's lives. And so I have a, I have ten principles here. I'll run through with you, and I'll show some examples how these um, how these work. Um, the first one is good design solves an important human problem. Um, and this is a quote from my, from my favorite author, um, one of my heroes of architecture, uh, Bill McDonough. Design is the first signal of uh, human intention. Um, so what is our intent for the world? Uh, what is our intent for a company, for a product, for a service? Um, you know, design is really the, that first indication of that intent. And it goes straight to the customer. Customers will understand what your intent is um, in, this, um, in, uh, in this world. So here's a, here's a problem um, that needed a, uh, a solution. Anyone here who has children knows the problem. Um, lack of sleep for parents. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's not just a hazard of the lifestyle or you know, the joys of having children. To, to, to be tired. It's actually a health issue. 25% um, uh, of spouses have postpartum depression, 50%, 15% of mothers. Um, it's, um, there's exhaustion, there's illness, um, marital conflict, and a lot of costs. Um, you know, family costs, healthcare costs, enterprise costs um, that are related to that. And so five years ago, I met uh, Dr. Harvey Karp, and he's, he's somewhat of a celebrity and, um, you know, and a guru, really, for, for, for parents. He wrote this book, The Happiest Baby on the Block. It uses a methodology of um, how, to, how to put your baby to sleep and keep them asleep. Um, it, it involves swaddling the baby, keeping it in a tight environment, and involves making these shushing noises that really replicate the... Um, um, the, the the, the womb and how a baby has been in the womb for, for nine months. Uh, it involves swinging the baby back and forth, um, creating a, a movement. Um, you know, if you think of it, um, babies are in this noisy environment for nine months, um, constantly moving with organs and movement of the mother, um, very, very tightly wrapped up. And suddenly they come out and they're put in a room that is completely silent. I mean, that must be terrifying. Um, you know, that, that type of change. So, so what we wanted to do, we wanted to replicate Harvey, who is so good at, at, um, um, at this method, and essentially turn Harvey into a robot. <clears throat> so these are early um, tests that we, we did at MIT. So we worked with an, a team of MIT engineers um, on uh, rocking and uh, moving. And this is still when, when the units looked very much like a robot. Um, uh, were, were, you know, was, was, were quite complex. 
uh, in a lab. It was difficult at the time to ask mothers to put their babies in, um, in there. <laughs> um, they, were, they were a little reluctant. And um, the next princip principle is that good design doesn't follow historical cliches. Um, so I spent the last five years talking to people about a project that I'm really excited about, because that's what pe everybody asks you. What's the next thing? What are you working on? And um, I really wanted to tell them more about this project, but I, I decided to just say this. I'm working on a robot that takes care of your baby. And this is immediately what they thought about. And if you really look at the tech labs and the engineering, um, the engineering uh, uh, firms, um, you know, the large tech companies that are working on robots, their robots look like this. You know, uh, Boston Robotics. Um, and, and, and when people see this, they say, I don't want to live in such a sort of tech um, in, environment. I, you know, this is not what I'm, uh, that, this is not what I'm aspiring to. That Boston, you know, Boston uh, Dynamics um, uh, video came out, and I got 15 people from Tech Labs sending, sending me the link saying, how cool is this? And then I went on social media, and it was, you know, people were scared. People were um, sort of hated seeing um, humanoid-like robots uh, living amongst us and, 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 and looking like us. So going beyond these cliches is really important um, when you execute on some of these technologies. Um, I think, I believe that every machine in this new age um, really def des needs to define itself for, um, for its func function and beyond the cliches that we can think about. So we need to design it as a new form, uh, new interactions, uh, new experience, and, and a new service for the user. So this is what it looks like. This is the robot that takes care of your baby. When you first see it, it doesn't seem like there is a robot. Um, you know, it, 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 we aspire it to be the most beautiful object in the baby's room or um, in your bedroom. And how does it work? Um, it is a very sort of cozy, uh, soft environment that we had to create. Um, the baby is, we call it a smart sleeper. We got rid of the sort of robot words. Um, and um, the baby is completely surrounded by this uh, mesh. The mesh is somewhat transparent, translucent, so that the parent can always see the baby, even when they're laying in bed and don't want to get up just to check on it. Um, and um, the, the, the challenge is, it, you will see in a second, the whole, the whole bed is moving and reacts to whether the, ba the baby is... Uh, crying or, 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 or starting to wake up, and it starts to move. And so that entire surface, that entire um, uh, translucent uh, fabric has to move, um, has to let the bed uh, move back and forth without creating space where people could get pinched. So, um, but it looks like a, a very cozy environment. We even designed the, the, the uh, swaddle, um, which is uh, attached to the side of, um, of, the, um, of the bed. Um, and this is arguably the most important part of the innovation. Um, we just got a ruling from the American Academy of uh, Pediatrics that babies should be kept on their back for the first six months. And so this is the very first uh, bed that um, will ensure that the baby is always on its back because the swaddle actually attaches to, um, to the side of the, um, of the bed. And the, and the, um, the sleeper will not work um, um, without, um, uh, without, without the attachments being in place. So these are angry, furious babies that we place in there. You can see their faces, they're red and unhappy. Um, and there's a noise that automatically uh, uh, starts moving the, um, the, the baby's bed. And the movement goes at different speeds depending on how aggravated uh, the babies are. Did you notice? They stopped crying. This one's already out, sleeping. This one's definitely sleeping. This one's sleeping over there. So you go pretty quickly from the most annoying uh, sound, the most you know um, uh, sound that parents hate to um, 
head to here to probably the most beautiful site, which is um, your baby falling asleep. But when you look at it, it is really a robot when you take it apart. Um, there are sensors, um, there is uh, microphones that are, that are listening to the baby, speakers. Uh, the microphones and the speakers are embedded within the, um, um, the translucent uh, fabric covers. Uh, the, the, the movements and the Wi-Fi and everything is, um, all the other sort of elements are isolated uh, for silence and also for Wi-Fi isolation from, from the baby entirely um, in the base. Um, the legs are there for stability, um, and, um, and it, it needs to be at the, right, at the right height, obviously, to make it easy for the mom to, uh, or the father to put the baby inside and out of it. But I think another element that, is, uh, that really makes this project different is like, unlike other projects that are you know, robotics projects, this wasn't started by a lab. It wasn't started by a group of engineers. This project was started by, you know, with, by a, a humanist, by um, a pediatrician who has really um, spent his life trying to solve this uh, sleep, um, sleep problem for parents. Um, and the results um, you know, show, you know, show that. And I think having that humanist, having that um, human first, uh, experience first approach to, um, you know, to designing these types of products is, um, is, uh, is critical. The third one is good design is something you need every day. Um, you know, I want to design technology that isn't something that you just use once in a while or that comes in handy uh, uh, once every week or two, uh, but rather um, you know, focus on experiences that, um, that are part of the, um, our everyday. So you know, there is software that accompanies the crib and it certainly will give you information and perspective on progress, how much more the baby is sleeping, um, how many times the, the baby wakes up, how many times the, the, the snoo, the crib is called the snoo, um, helps it um, put it back to sleep. But here's a different, um, a different innovation that, um, that I've worked on and that really I can't live without for the last um, two years or so, I have lived keyless. Uh, my home, my office, um, my other companies, startups, offices, um, all use an August, um, an August um, lock. And this is, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's essentially a small robot that sits on the inside of your door. You can't see it on, from the outside. Um, and it allows um, for digital keys, keys on your cell phone, to, um, to open the door. And what we have seen is, um, just like email, in a, in a way, the, the convenience of people, of these keys going, you know, going from being sharp little pieces of metal in your pocket to uh, being digital, being code, um, means that people are um, giving away digital keys more and more. And, um, um, it, you know, it's, 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 it is really life transforming and, it, and I don't think five years from now that um, we will have many of those sharp little pieces of metal in our pockets anymore. Good design works for everyone. So I'm sure you're also familiar with this. Um, I'm sure you're considered the technical person in the family. Um, and um, you know, when I think about home automation, uh, when I think about technology that is brought into the home, usually uh, in a lot of cases, it's uh, the people who installed it that love it, and then everyone else in the family really hates it. Um, so I want to show you activities uh, at, my, at my home. Uh, my contractor, my nanny, um, my kids, uh, my wife, people coming in and out, and me being completely, absolutely aware of, uh, of what is going on. So that level of awareness um, and practicality is something that has um, really changed um, the, way, the way my home functions. You know, and, and this universality of the product um, is really important because the, the, the makeup of the home has changed. Um, it, is, it, is, it used to be homogeneous. It used to be a family cell that is, that is, um, that is um, um, more traditional. 
um, and now it is more diverse, connected, and social. So the people that these products have to speak to are, are, are completely different. Um, we did a product, for example, called Hive for British Gas, and um, that's 16 million homes. Um, it's the, it's the British-made competitor to Nest. Um, and that's 16 million homes that, um, you know, where it's a lot of retirees, people that didn't use to touch their thermostat. In fact, 70% um, of temperature settings remained exactly the same throughout the year in England, you know, um, because people didn't want to touch it. So we, we, we redesigned that product and, and uh, made tremendous uh, progress on that task completion there. Um, good design and tech needs to be discrete. So I'll give you an example of what happens um, in my home. I come home and I want to focus on, on, um, on those children. I have them, they're in, um, in, they're in the uh, two to nine year old range. And, um, but I have to change the music, I have to change the sound, I have to adjust the temperature in my house. And so I have pull out my phone and I start doing that. And I get screened by my children who um, are you know, accusing me of texting. And I'm like, I'm not texting, I'm just changing the music or I'm you know, uh, uh, organizing our evening. And this is, this is, this is a big issue for, for, for me and I think it's a big issue for a lot of people. It's our reliance on screens and for, for information and control um, is something that we need to, to, to address as, um, as, uh, as designers. So, you know, there are many different um, types of signals that can come to us. Um, um, we mentioned earlier Alexa, voice is obviously one. But if we think about the 10,000 10, years of human evolution, um, we, you know, our senses are tuned um, in ways that um, is currently unused or not, un, um, you know, not, not, you know, not that, that technology isn't, um, isn't tapping into. Um, if, if a storm is coming, I may be feeling the wind, I may be feeling temperature change, I will naturally turn to that information, information that, you know, again, our instincts have been tuned to. Um, and so, you know, for August, for example, um, the auto unlock functions allows me to get home every day and I don't have to do anything. Uh, my phone is in my pocket, my door unlocks. There are some signals, for example, the, 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 I can have the phone vibrate in my pocket just to confirm that something is happening as I'm moving towards it. From the interior, there is LEDs that are invisible, um, that, uh, that are invisible when they're not in use, and there is a chime. All these uh, signals can be tuned. None of them require um, the use of a display. And I think more and more it's going to be critical in our use of technology as more data, we want to communicate more data, we want to give more control to users, it's going to be critical to go beyond the display um, to, to communicate this information. Good technology and design is a platform that grows with uh, needs and opportunities. So for August, you know, we, we, we started with, the first step was to allow people to open doors and to manage their keys, to give keys away digitally. But we do imagine a world where our customers come home from work and the house is clean, the dog is walked, the groceries are delivered, um, maybe a package, a gift has been uh, brought in by FedEx or UPS inside your home. Um, there is, I think, 12 or 18 million packages that are stolen from, from, from your doorsteps every, um, every year. Um, and maybe a guest is welcome. Into, into your home. We actually have developed a full integration with uh, Airbnb. So currently, if you're renting my house on, um, on Airbnb, um, you will automatically get a key um, delivered to you. And what do we see with that, um, with that kind of functionality? Um, we see a, a great uptick in, um, in, in people wanting to use uh, Airbnbs and liking the system because the key exchange, um, is, as some of you may know, is really the, the biggest pain point for, um, for Airbnb. And we just added um, a doorbell cam, which now allows you to receive uh, notifications from anywhere. Um, I use it, I have delivery people coming to, to my home. I let them into, I tell them to open the door and, and, and let, uh, drop a package in. They're pleasantly surprised because no one hates more um, 
hates anything more than that yellow tag on your door. Um, um, and um, and uh, it's part of, 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 of the integrations that, um, that we are working on. Good technology and design um, learns and predicts human behavior. Here's an interesting project and an inter interesting problem uh, to solve, uh, which is the overcrowding of cities, the expensive real estate, and the fact that apartments are getting smaller and smaller. When you have young technical workers coming into Seattle, San Francisco, uh, New York, London, um, they can't find a place to, to stay at. They can't find some, uh, an affordable space. So more and more um, uh, micro apartments or, or junior, um, uh, junior studios, as they're called, are being built. Those are in the two to 300 square feet um, uh, size. And um, you know, they're, not, they're, they're, they're a solution, but they're not, they're not great for life. So this is a 250 square foot apartment. Um, the bed just slid in. I'm not I'm sure if you noticed. Um, there is a closet there. You can turn that area into an office and you can have a slightly li you know, larger uh, living room. This is a startup uh, we worked on with um, MIT. It's using uh, very simple actuators. In this case that I'm showing, it's only uh, using the actuator that's on the floor. Um, and it's using AI and other, um, this is a, just a very quick movie, um, um, other technologies there to, um, to allow, to predict uh, behavior um, and to create more intelligence uh, with the system over time. Um, so here's a small but usable <laughs> living room. Um, there's a lot of practicality that's built into, into the system. You can have your TV, you can have your storage. One of my favorite um, uh, function um, and I think especially for this age group it's going to be true, is the fact your bed, your bed gets made. Your bed gets put away. Um, and um, again, the, the, the system can be um, used manually or it can be done uh, remotely from, uh, from a phone. Um, and a closet is built in, so when the bed's away you have access to a closet. Um, and you also have the, um, the option to um, um, to do to do work from home, which is very much um, part of the part of the lifestyle of that generation. <clears throat> Good design and technology uh, accelerates change. That is probably the, the the one reason I and we all get up in the morning is we want to see change happen. And um, the 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 way I define good design is that it, um, good design accelerates the adoption of new ideas. All these very critical, very important 21st, 21st century new ideas, for example, that sustainability uh, means better products, more efficient and cost-effective uh, results, and also uh, uh, production cost. Um, universal technology uh, that can be used uh, by everyone, um, invisible displays, you know, all these important ideas, you know, for example, the fact that design, uh, the fact that um, developing economies need to, to, to build their own uh, solutions, um, you know, all of these are important new ideas that we believe design can accelerate. Somebody talked about um, uh, their Teslas. You know, I know if it wasn't for a, a completely new approach to, um, to, um, to, car, you know, to electric car design, I don't think we would be where we are today uh, with all the European um, car companies fin finally jumping into um, into electric cars. It's late, but they're doing it finally. Um, and um, and uh, with, with, with electric cars really being seen as, the, as, a, as our very near future. And beyond electric, obviously, with uh, self-driving. Um, we do a number of projects in the developing world. Um, um, this is uh, an accelerator called Spring. Um, we take on 18 entrepreneurs. Um, in this case, on the first round, um, this was uh, Kenya, Rwanda, and Uganda. And we support them through uh, cycles um, of, of development of their businesses. Um, it includes um, um, business prototyping, it includes uh, customer acquisition, it includes um, marketing, it includes all the different elements. But we use the principles of design for them to quickly prototype and quickly experiment with, um, with their businesses. Um, I'll just use one example from this first group. Um, <clears throat> in Kenya, 
50% of Kenyans have never seen a doctor, not even at birth. Um, and this allows um, um, Charles Komodo, who's a, a known doctor from uh, Kenya, um, uh, is creating a, um, an app that allows for um, doctors that have free time, a lot of them have free time, to connect with, um, with patients by, by voice or by video. Um, and in the case of adolescent girls, for example, which this, this uh, spring is supported by um, um, Nike's Girl Effect and other sort of girl-focused organizations, um, in the case of, uh, of adolescent girls, um, sometimes it is intimidating to meet uh, a doctor in person. So a phone uh, consultation or a video consultation is better. But of course, it also works for the entire population. Um, other other nonprofits, you know, we, we, we have helped build. This is Verbien, distributes about half a million eyeglasses in Mexico every year. Um, we were able to design vertically integrate a factory that has uh, lenses and frames um, all made in the same place in a factory in Mexico. Um, the result is $5 glasses, eyeglasses that are given to children that, um, school children that can't afford them. Um, and we've distributed about four and a half million of them. And then earlier we mentioned um, the One Laptop Per Child, um, which um, we, you know, we, when we started, nobody believed that uh, laptops had anything to do with a developing world in education. And today it's become a major business for, um, for a lot of the, you know, Dells and Intels of this world. So um, this was, um, this was a, a big, um, uh, a big breakthrough in many ways. So good technology and design brings about products and services that build relationships. I'm just going to go quick here so we have some time for, um, for uh, questions. Um, um, this is a project I did in 1999 before Bluetooth, um, before Wi-Fi, but the idea was to change the relationship between a customer of a, a, a shoe brand or a fashion brand by having a chip that is removable and the chip uh, records um, my weight changes, record how, how much I walk, my pronation, and then that information is used to make a better product. So when I go buy my next pair of Nikes or Adidas, it's not just a fashion statement, um, it's also a product that's built specifically for me as a user. Um, and this is probably something that you will relate to, something that I always say is that good design in the end, there's many definitions of what good design is, but good design is how you treat your customers. If you treat your customers well from an ergonomic standpoint, from an emotional standpoint, um, from, a, from an engagement standpoint, um, from a beauty and aesthetic standpoint as well, you're probably doing good design. And then finally, uh, good design at the end needs to remove complexity from our lives. Um, and there's many things that technology should be doing. There's many things that we should uh, take on as um, um, with AI and big data, et cetera. But there's probably a lot of tasks that should be <laughs> left to human beings. And um, um, at the end of the day, I think what's, <laughs> What's most important is <laughs> how do we imbue technology and artificial intelligence with human values, um, not just technical values, not just features. Um, and the goal is, um, for me at the end, you know, maybe what we, the, the takeaway um, for all of us is that we can maybe get there if we design with intent, if we focus on the human experience if we explore and inspire and, 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 and accelerate change as a result. Thank you very much.